Hey, buddies, Potato McWhiskey here, and welcome to Let's Play Civilization VI as Scotland. Now, we are second in science right now at 673. Georgia is doing pretty well at 632, but Vietnam is absolutely stonking their way around the map with 890 science. Now, the one upside of that is that... I think the AI isn't quite as good as I am at manipulating their way through the tech tree. So even though I'm behind them scientifically, I think I'm ahead of them production-wise because I have already launched, I believe, the Earth satellite and I'm two turns away from the moon landing, just quickly getting that coal power plant rep repaired. Whereas if we take a look at the AI, Battery U is on the same trajectory as me, essentially. So I think I can outsmart her and still beat her, even though she's got more science than me, because I still haven't made uh, full friendships with a lot of these scientific city-states, and my science will scale pretty hard if I can get a few more envoys. And the great thing is we're about to get moon landing, and there's plenty of envoys to pick up here in the civic tree in the late game, in particular around about here for cultural heritage. There's three there, and then near future governance is a few more. So there's probably like nine more envoys sitting in the, sitting in the culture tree, so if I could get a couple of suzerainties, maybe even declare war on Batryu to deny her those bonuses from the city states that I'm suzerain of, I think I'll be able to I'll be able to put a significant dent in her science per turn. Now everyone hates her, so I could also levy that into uh, her wasting her time in a big war, especially if I could, for example, get a friendship with Sumeria, get a military alliance with Sumeria, see if he'll pay me anything, and then maybe see if I can get him plus like Portugal, plus uh, maybe Georgia to go to war. Although Georgia doesn't really like me very much, but I definitely feel like I could maybe get, uh, I could definitely get Sumeria. I could definitely get Sumeria in on this war. Um, that would significantly distract, significantly distract her. So the only thing I would need is a good Cass's belly. Um, and then otherwise, I'm actually just gonna go ahead and get a research alliance with Guitarja so that any trade routes she sends me, I'll get a bit of a science boost. And I might even look to set up some better trade routes too. Now I am at war with the Kree and I'm at war with ba Byzantium. So I could also conquer a little bit with my aircraft. I could pick up a, um, I could pick up a bomber and slowly pick off their cities and work my way towards Vietnam. I have my options open right now in terms of how I want to approach this end game. But mostly I think it's just actually running these projects and, and hitting those end game milestones. The, the big problem I face though is her culture per turn is way higher than mine. So I could be running into some issues. With that said, in some of my cities, I am going to start working campus research grants in order to start converting my production into science and making sure that I have my campuses maxed out with um, with science, basically. So I'll be focusing on science and production in a lot of these cities. And that'll just give me a way to get my science just a little bit higher to where I could be a bit more confident about how likely I am to actually beat Vietnam to the punch when it comes to the science victory. Now the one big advantage I have is I almost certainly have a more effective capital than her. Like my capital is just far and away better. And the big weakness I have is that I'm only I'm only sending space race things from a single spaceport, but I do have my diplomatic quarter next to it. So that is an advantage in my favor because the diplomatic quarter gives you extra spy defense on the tiles that it is located on or, or adjacent to. And I think it's also time in my capital to retool all these farms. Those farms are super useful early in the game, but I'm probably gonna lay down a couple of neighborhoods and start replacing all of these tiles with instead things like woods. Now. Wait a minute, I can place a golf course in this city. And I could actually use the amenities, so let's start clearing out this tile to put a golf course on it. We are in a new age. It is unfortunately a dark age, so we're not gonna get massive bonuses here, but we can at least take Heartbeat of Steam here and get a good amount of score for the next era. Sitting on four envoys, I don't care about Susan Tree of Taruga. Hattusa is fine. Mitla could be useful. Fez I don't think is super useful unless I plan to turn my faith into science, which is actually a viable thing for me to do here. I could alternatively use my faith to purchase certain great people, but I kind of like the idea of um, using my faith as a way to generate science here. So I might take Fez over. Yeah, let's grab Fez, right? Put all of my envoys in there. Boom, now I control Fez and they're like down here somewhere, right? Yeah, they're all the way down in the corner. So they should be relatively safe and hard to actually conquer. And now I can come into a place like Dumfries and start spamming out some of these units here. Should be about to launch the moon landing. I'm okay with peace with Byzantium. I hurt his cities a little bit. I made him go away. So that works just fine for me. 
And there is the moon landing. So we should get about 8,000 culture out of that, which should pretty much finish off most of our late game stuff that we were trying to unlock, like Cold War. And now we really just want to get International Space Agency for that 5% science per city state that you're suzerain of. And perhaps even e-commerce for the plus two production and plus five gold from all trade routes, which could be dead helpful. Now I could launch the Mars colony right now. Let me think about that. Does that make sense? I feel like there's an awful lot of wasted food in this city. And I also need to get something like the Royal Society. And if I'm gonna go for the Royal Society, then it probably makes sense to do that now and actually change Dumfries from this production over instead to builder production and then start purchasing builders in this city with a view to spend them in the spaceport, which also means I need to start increasing my gold income rapidly or else I'm not gonna be able to afford it. So I think lighthouses are gonna be useful for that. My empire scales hard off campuses. What could I do in the city to help out? I do need a spy, so I may as well get started on that. But the problem is I could build a campus in here, which would actually increase my science per turn and thus increase how quick I win the game. And instead come over to somewhere like Dundee, build a spy slower, yes, but not actually significantly impact my science per turn. Now I think I'm in a new era, so I need to start thinking about my final my final vampire, which could be useful. And with that in mind, I'll need to think about maybe buying this tile and a builder down here to close that out. I don't know when I get my next governor title. It's actually only a few turns from now with globalization. It's actually only two turns from now with that. So let's get started. We'll buy a builder in here. It's not an efficient builder. Maybe I should have walked it down from Dumfries because I actually have the railroads, but I'll get a builder down here to improve these tiles. And that'll let me prep this vampire castle. And then I'll probably go around and retool each of these vampire castles now that I've hit my late game production level. Railroads are fantastic for religious units as well. Probably going to build a railroad all the way up to Byzantium's territory and see if we can start doing a bit of conversion there. So golf course in this city, that'll bring us up to plus four amenities. And then I don't think we need electricity. So lumber mills are the way to go with these builder charges. I think I just accidentally double tapped end turn, which is absolutely not what I wanted. So I am going to have to reload a turn, which sucks. Or you know what? I'm, I'm actually, you know what? I'm actually just going to accept the mistake. It's fine. Um, we double tapped end turn. We got our governor title. We'll promote you. Endless night. Cool. So you have to be careful. I, I, I just, I hit Z at the exact perfect time. It's happened to me before where I have, I have Z set up to be my end of, uh, my end game thing that, um, so if I remove this improvement like that, my vampires gain build charges. Very cool. So we're going to go through and probably remove the vampire castles and then replace them. And we're going to replace them specifically because we want the, uh, we want to update the yields on them. Basically we have the Royal Society in the capital. Let's grab ourselves the Mars colony. We have lost a bit of production in here. And that's just due to the way that I've been modifying the city, uh, in particular getting rid of those vampire castles, but that will come back very shortly and we'll continue to feed builders in here and that'll shave two turns off each of those Mars colonies. I'm curious, how well is Batriu doing? She doesn't even have Mars colony yet. So I'll be ahead of her in production towards things and her science has dropped just a smidge. So we're neck and neck essentially right now. So using the espionage mod that I have on the UI mod that should be linked in the description. I have a list of all my UI mods. Um, we're going to look for spaceports and then ideally train up our spies to delete them and also steal gold and stuff like that. So I'll be spending any surplus spies I have to Vietnam. Also, I think it's time we, we checked in on our railroad progress and we're making really, really, really good progress on the railroads. Pretty much have railroads spanning my entire empire now. The only bit that's missing out is down here in the south, but I'll probably just do a bit of cross-linking up here and then I consider my railroads done. And while those railroads may not seem important, they can be helpful for moving troops around and getting builders from city to city. All right, lovely, all that overflow culture came to fruition and now we have globalization, which will trigger us to change our government policy slightly. Now we are doing mostly internal trade routes and so collectivization is really good. However, uh, maybe it would be better if we had e-commerce plugged in. We definitely wanna have, like 100%, we wanna have the International Space Station plugged in. Like that's just a given. But are there other things we want to have plugged in? I feel like e-commerce is really good here because I am doing mostly domestic trade routes and I'm probably going to start centralizing all my trade routes into my capital. Collectivization is fine. I wish I had a way to get more gold, but I don't really unless I go to war. But I'm more or less happy with this government. We get extra build charges on our builders. We get lots of gold in production from our trade routes. We get lots of science in production from our districts. We get lots of food and production from our districts. So yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty okay with this. I wish there was a more optimal government. Communism is weak in one sense. It, it does have that really nice plus 10% science on it but it comes with some disadvantages in particular in the in the way that you have to set your government up because it's very heavy on the military policy cards which is not always the best although actually there is 
a small modification that I should have made to my government that I didn't. And that would have been plugging in integrated space cell and maybe building an encampment in my capital. So that was probably just a problem of foresight um, where I just, I didn't think ahead enough. And it's a relatively minor mistake, but a mistake it still is. So let's go back through now. And well, actually we still have a lot of overflow. Yeah, we're not gonna actually, no, 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 change my mind. We're gonna go back through now and grab all the envoy points that we missed. So opera and ballet and cultural heritage and stuff like that. And if we pick all those up, actually, ooh, I should totally have Science Foundation plugged in. So I go Science Foundation, then I'll pick up Naval for Tradition for the Envoy, then I'll pick up Opera and Ballet for that one, and then I'll pick up Cultural Heritage for those Envoys. And I want those Envoys, again, to scale off of these city-states. So let's re-plop down a Vampire Castle here. Now, if you remember, the old one was really strong. It was like in the 20 production mark, but this is a 29 production. I think it was actually like 17 production or something like that. But this is now eight gold, 11 food, 29 production and two faith, which is incredible. We're also gonna replace this one because it's currently seven food and 32 production. Oh wait, did that get updated? I thought vampire castles don't get updated. Huh, did it get refreshed? I think it maybe got refreshed. Huh, weird. I thought vampire castles don't get refreshed. Did they make a change and I didn't notice? Maybe they did. Damn cool, it. so there's a nuclear program. I am gonna have to make a hard choice here. And I think getting rid of collectivization is the right move. The gold is very helpful for buying builders and science foundation will give me two great scientist points for every university and four great scientist points for every research lab, which is just amazing scaling. And then the same for factories and power plants for great engineers. So this is almost required in the late game in order to get those late game great people because Erwin Schrodinger, for example, uh, I'm competing with Vietnam, they have 44, points I'm making 36 uh, or else it's 48,000 gold to buy them and the same for Alvar Alto and all those other great engineers. So there is smart materials we can launch our exoplanet expedition well ahead of Vietnam which pretty much seals the deal for a win for me. I'm feeling very good about that. The only thing that can stop me is my spaceport getting pillaged or getting uh, into some kind of nuclear war, which I'm feeling pretty confident about my ability to avoid. But we should not get too big for our britches. We should always err on the side of caution. All right, time to pop down, I think our last vampire castle, one, two, three. And then I have one up here that's currently pumping out a healthy 13 production. That'll probably get moved uh, over, I don't know, somewhere. I actually don't really have a good spot for it, but I know this one is gonna absolutely crank for me. If the tooltip would ever appear, oh my God, give me my tool. Can I have a tooltip? There we go, 28 production, 11 food. Absolutely cranking out stuff in my capital now. We're up to 177 production, which is a healthy number. A very healthy number. And we've also almost eclipsed 1,000 science per turn, which is quite an achievement, I feel like. I feel like there's actually, I don't know how many people have actually hit that. Oh shit, I misclicked with that guy. Um, but I find a lot, a lot of people are like, oh my God, 800 science, like that's impressive. Whereas that's like a normal end game for me in most of my games. I'm curious actually, how high does your science get in your science game, guys? Do you typically, like, like what turn do you usually win by? Because I usually know I've won the game around 230 to 250. Like that's when I know I've won the game for sure. And I'll typically win the game somewhere around 250. I consider myself to have won the game already. I just need to like execute the final steps of the plan. But otherwise we're there, we're done. It's, there's always a bittersweet moment for me when I win a game because yes, I get the win screen, but it means I also don't, I, I kind of have to say goodbye to my empire. And to me, like my little empires, I know it's not artistic, but they do kind of feel like a piece of art. Like they feel like something I've invested something into. Having to say goodbye to them is, you know, bittersweet. Yes, I've won and it, that's exciting and all that sort of stuff, but this is also my little empire. I made this. You know, and I don't want to, I, I almost don't want to say goodbye to it. But then again, sometimes if I've been playing a long time or, you know, a game has been particularly troublesome or annoying, um, I'm actually happy to see the back of a game. I'm like, okay, thank God that's over. But now tech wise, I think we just rush to the end of the tech tree. We don't have to worry about flooding. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. The only thing we need is this final tech right here. And that'll make our space race projects go even faster. I may actually move Liang to Cullen, although I'm probably just going to spam builders in two cities so that I have a constant stream to fill out the capital because I can't quite afford to do it off just one city. Sometimes you can afford to do that with the gold you have, but I'm not quite making enough gold this game. So we'll have to do it a little bit sort of more carefully. So I have suzerainty of uh, Fez. Now, what do you do? You are my theological strength guy, so I could just use you on this city and slowly chip away at the faith pressure. You, however, an extra spreader. So how are we doing? Ah, the real thing is, uh, see this city's, the city's pressure is locked in pretty highly here. So what we need is a proselytizer. He needs to kill all that un 
unfettered pressure here because a lot yeah i'm gonna need a lot of proselytizers if i'm gonna use this so it's time to just start mass buying apostles and pray for proselytizer missionaries are good at spreading versus cities that don't have a lot of uh that have a bit of this pantheon stuff here you see this kind of gap in pressure when the when the thing isn't full that's room for you to convert more of the population but if the whole circle is full it can be very hard to spread using missionaries because they only eliminate a small proportion of the pressure each time they spread and it's the same with things you, you really need those proselytizers to to crack open these cities and that's what this guy will do for us next turn and I, i'm doing that just to pick up that extra little bit of science so i can i can win an extra couple of turns it's it's pretty micro intense strategy but um it could be worth it to do it, could be, it can be worth it it's probably not worth it in terms of like my personal man hours but maybe it'll shave like a turn off the game which is pretty respectable anything that shaves a turn off your game is, is worth pursuing in my opinion because uh, ultimately when you get to a certain level of gameplay in Civ really your goal is no longer about winning it's more about um, what strategies and game modes and interesting things can I do in the game and how fast can I win you know like can I win with this Civ doing this strategy or can I win doing this particular strategy that precludes some of their game mechanic like maybe the no city state challenge like I have to just hold on to all of my envoys and I can only do city-state missions like these sorts of things are are how the player um sort of creates their own content for the game and uh that's not like a criticism of the game that's just like a natural part I'm gonna refuse to uh cancel my spreading because the spreading is worth science to me so I've converted Ankara this is going to be a bastion of my religion over here it's kind of annoying that Hinduism and Eastern Orthodoxy have like basically the exact same color it kind of bothers me a little bit now out of curiosity how is the spread in here now these cities are pretty old and mature so they don't have a lot of un unused spread pressure that should be more or less true for most of the game um, most people should have their religion basically filled out on all their cities there's like a little bit of open pressure in some of these cities because I'm pretty sure you can only have there's only a certain amount of pressure you can put into a city right and it has to do with the the way the mechanics work maybe, maybe I can show you a practical example here actually can I get in range of a city no I'll have to do it next turn but I'll, I'll show you at Vilnius or maybe Trevisand is a better example yeah Trevisand is a better example fortunately I don't think I hit any more proselytizers um which is going to make spreading my religion hard for science which is unfortunate but it is what it is sometimes you get lucky um I've noticed that there's this thing whereas if you if you recruit an apostle from the same city on the same turn you will often get the same promotion on both apostles so that could be really good in the sense that if you hit really well on a on a thing that you actually want perfect you, you got everything you wanted but if you don't hit what you want it actually kind of sucks so we're gonna start trading a little bit internationally in my capital for the extra science and stuff we are officially over 1000 science per turn by the way which feels pretty damn nice and also just for memes i built a uh i built a railroad going through a, a <laughs> golf course <laughs> Mars colony has been ejected into the stratosphere all the way to Mars cool we pick up a bit of error score from that and it puts us one step closer along the track of winning the game I'd actually like my capital to grow ever so slightly because we can work actually can we work more tiles Ooh, that's a good question see I could spend two turns building a neighborhood or I could immediately get to work on the exoplanet expedition ah oh, man I was thinking neighborhood made sense here but you know what just exoplanet it up let's go let's get that launching so I, I think I, I can show you this here if I step in beside Trebizond right right now it has a 185 pressure from happiness peace and love if I come in here and I use this it says plus 200 and we end up now with 388 happiness peace and love but all of the other ones have been reduced by 10 percent so you can kind of see that it doesn't work exactly the way you would expect you actually end up slightly better off than compared to where you would be now I'm going to use this guy's thing right so keep track of these numbers at uh, 3247 and 2464 you don't have to remember them exactly because I'm about to change those numbers and you'll see they have went down now Wait, can I get that UI to update please I think it only updates when a when a thing actually changes so I'd have to get the turn to roll over although maybe I can force an update by moving a moving a guy no well you can see how not much changed in this city by using that right we're up to still up to 3 AA pressure but if I come in here and use the proselytizer it will destroy 75 percent of this pressure and almost immediately open the city up for conversion you can see here now the pressure is down to 282 or 82 eight to eight rather so you always want to use your proselytizers first and then come in with your missionaries because it's so much easier to convert a city after you eliminate the um the religious pressure in it so I, I did things backwards but I did it I did it backwards on purpose right in order to in order to demonstrate uh, a point can I actually surround this guy and get a kill it's possible 
but is it probable? Well, we can get them really low, which is almost as good. Railroad-wise, I'm more or less happy with the interconnectivity of my empire in the north. Um, there is a bit of a bottleneck at Aberdeen, but that's fine, I think. Probably, yeah, more or less happy. I don't think there's really much to change now. So this military engineer can probably just go to sleep now. He's done his job. Pretty much laying down the last couple of railroads down here too. One one thing I have about railroads is I feel like I don't get to play very long with railroads. Like it feels like they come into the game and then they go away. And by the time I have them laid out, they're kind of just redundant. Oh, she has uh, she has giant death robots. Yeah, that's just, that's just kind of how I feel about them. That they come into the game, you get your railroads, you lay them down. And then by the time you've laid them down, the game is over. Like because I pretty much started laying down my railroad the second I got it. So I don't know. I feel like that's something that could maybe use a bit of adjustment. Now you might be wondering, Potato, why are you working at night? Well, there's two reasons for that. The first one is it's really hot during the day. All right. It's been really, really warm and I don't like it. And the uh, the second reason is that uh, I've been, you know, I have a little bit of trouble sleeping. It's uh, not been ideal. Ideal sleep times in the, uh, in the potato household. So I've been awake at night, not for any particular reason. I just like... There's nothing bothering me. I just, sometimes I have trouble sleeping. Um, it's a bit of a weird affliction because it doesn't actually really affect my life negatively. It just makes things awkward and annoying, but I don't mind it. Like I, I don't have obligations. Wait, why am I not getting, oh, there's the science. So there's the 340 science I'm getting from converting these cities. So you can see why it was basically a way for me to convert faith into science, as well as a bit of culture as well, which is always nice. Cause I am getting like, I think the majority of my cult, no, not the majority, but a big chunk of my culture is coming from my beliefs. Um, yeah, so that's why I've been recording at odd times. Cause either I'm waking up really early or I'm, I'm awake really late. So I, I don't get, <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't, I don't get like a normal sleep schedule. I've, I've had a normal sleep schedule for like periods in my life, but I think, I think I'm just cursed with like, um, that thing, you know, where you, uh, there's like a name for it. God, why can't I remember it? It's basically where you, you go to bed later and later each night, no matter what time you go to bed at. I think it's called like a polyphasic sleep cycle or something, or it's like a delayed phase sleep cycle or something. Basically in a nutshell, my shit is messed up and it's hard to fix. Okay. Um, probably, probably should go to a sleep, uh, sleep therapist and see if I can get, um, I don't know, like, what do you call those stuff that you get? Not mil not melatonin, mel melatonin, melatonin. I can't remember what it's called. Something like that. Anyway, the stuff that tells your body it's 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 night night nap time. You know what I mean? I guarantee you, 100%. There's like a dozen people. You know, well more dozens of people listening to what I just talked about and are like, yeah, I have that too. My sleep is messed up, dude, and it really sucks. I'm like very lucky because I work for myself doing YouTube stuff. So if my sleep is messed up, I can just, I can just work whenever. But if I, if I had to like work to someone else's schedule, oh my God, dude, I would hate life so much. So I really, my heart goes out to people that, um, that are not self-employed. It's just, you know, just because of the, the circumstances they're in, they don't have the option or whatever. So if you have that problem, dude, absolutely. Um, I feel for you. Where did my, where did my proselytizer go? I don't. Did I, did I move him somewhere weird? I don't know why I'm caring about this so much because it literally doesn't matter. Ah, there he is. Oh, this is another one. Oh, very good. I mean, it matters to me, I guess, to do this. I don't know. I feel like we would we would live in a better society if, um, if, pe if people could just get some sleep. You know, I feel that, I think that's like, the hottest take I'm going to give today. If we, if people got more sleep, we'd live in a better world because it sucks not having good sleep, dude. In almost any circumstance other than, other than like the, the very small circumstances that I exist in. And I, I think I've been trying to use that sort of thinking as a sort of metric to remind myself of how, how lucky I am that I get to do stuff like YouTube as a job. I think, I think it's like a human bias. I'm like 99% sure, but like something that affects you is like super, super important uh, to you personally, which is like fair enough. I mean, like the things that happen in your life obviously matter more to you. That's just like human nature, right? Or whatever. There's probably, there's probably studies on it. I don't know shit, right? But something I've been doing to try to keep myself, a, it doesn't work, I don't think, but at the very least it stops me whining about it so much is I try to remind myself that there are people in like worse circumstances than me. and I'm very lucky and you try to be grateful and I don't know if it actually helps, but it, I guess it kind of just helps me not to bang on about it too much. That's like the only advantage. I still feel shitty about it. Like it still sucks, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I guess, I, I guess it makes it like slightly easier to deal with, which I guess technically helps. Tech, I, that's technically helping. I'm not really talking about the game much because really a lot of what I'm doing is very rote. Like I'm just building things that give me science campuses, things like that and then spamming out campus research grants where it makes sense, spamming out builders, and then just continuously feeding builders into my spaceport as I uh, as I just convert this guy for a bit of bonus science. As I, I make sure that I'm Suzerain of Fez. He's got a high population empire, so I get a bit of science out of converting his cities. But yeah, other, other than other than those small micro readjustment-y stuff, um, 
there's not really a whole lot of like super engaging gameplay going on right here not gonna lie um the late game is always the most boring part of any Civ game which is fair enough like i mean it's, ha it's hard to have an interesting late game without making all of the previous eras pointless you know where you have some like oh world cataclysm event like the apocalypse mode kind of made in late game kind of interesting because it shakes up the world it's kind of like it's a very crude way to do it though right because you're basically rolling a dice to see what act actions in the past were irrelevant, um, which is a pretty crude way to shake up the late game, but it works. Like I'll, I'll give it that. It actually works at like goal achieved. Things are more interesting, um, even if it's very crude. All right, cool. He wants to buy my aluminum. I'm not gonna sell my aluminum. I was actually I was helping I was helping like do some gardening there um, a couple days ago, and uh, the way I was holding the shears, I wasn't I wasn't wearing gloves or anything. I probably should have had gloves on realistically, and uh, I was shearing the grass and I was shearing the bushes and. No, help him clean cut and do all that sort of stuff. And I got some blisters on my thumbs and they were in like really, really awkward spots. They're like, particularly my mouse hand thumb. Um, I got a blister like right on the side of my mouse hand. And uh, it's just like every now and again, I like touch off it wrong and I'm like, ooh, that didn't feel good. But yeah, we have launched the Exoplanet Expedition, as you saw. And we are currently working on the Lagrange laser station. So that's gonna cost me 30 aluminum every three turns. We're making a, eh, not an amazing amount of aluminum, but we should be able to support this for a while before we need to start doing the other one. And if we go to the science view here, you can see Battery U doesn't even have nanotechnology research. She does have smart materials. She just kind of, the, the tech path she's taking skipped nanotechnology. Cause I think she is trying to get all the boosts for her giant death robots. Cause she has a lot of giant death robots. Cause I think she still even has more science than me. No, 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 I've, I've actually outpaced her now. No, no, actually she, yeah, she has more tech research than I do. So. The, the problem is Battery U is trying to maybe go for some war stuff. She might even be at war or preparing for war, but she doesn't realize that she's like losing the game right now. I mean, she did give me a run for my money. Let's let's give credit where credit is due, but she didn't she didn't really uh, when you know, it all came down to brass tacks or whatever. It didn't really it didn't really stop me. Let's see pretty far away from converting a city. I don't think I need a debater. He's not spawning any like religious units. Now, having said that, it's going to start happening now. So we'll triple spread. Boom. Another city converted. That was only 80 science. It's a very low pop city. Probably not the best use to my religious units. But you know, I think converting city gets you score. I think I might start, I don't know. I think I might start trying to like do more wacky strategies. I've been kind of doing, I haven't been doing exactly the same thing. I've been trying to shake things up and keep the game interesting. And I think there's still a lot of unplumbed depths. And one of the big advantages of Civ 6 is the, you know, endless numbers of mods that are available for the game. So I don't think I'll ever run out of content to make for Civ, but I do think it's difficult to constantly come up with interesting content like that is actually a real challenge because obviously just playing the game is interesting yes of course we all agree that seeing someone play the game it's interesting you learn a lot you can see interesting strategies you can learn how to play civs you learn how bonuses work all that sort of stuff but i think there's also i think there's room for that and sort of the more wacky gameplay um and this is more of like the standard gameplay that people like so i like to sprinkle this in because i know that a lot of people love these let's play style things um but i also want to appeal to a slightly wider audience so i want to do both because i actually read like doing let's plays is the thing that i love but also this is a business so i also have to do things that maybe i don't enjoy you know challenges quite as much as i might other things but they're also good for the channel and good for me and, and they're you know they're not necessarily my favorite thing to do but i don't hate them either so they're kind of like i don't mind them they're, uh, and they're they are also good at keeping me sane um because i will admit you know i am human and if i were to continue to play the same game even though i love this game and i really enjoy it and you know it's my favorite game uh, essentially i think i think you can go a little bit mad if you only play one game and I, i've never really been a one game kind of person which is what's really really odd about being the Civ guy for now is that I was never the kind of guy who would play one game. I would always play a variety, but for some reason, I don't know why I did this. I just decided that I would play this game constantly forever and make it and try to see if I can make a YouTube channel out of it. And it actually kind of worked due to like a variety of luck based factors and all sorts of stuff like that, which is like an interesting thing in of itself, but also a little bit of a, a little bit of a weakness of mine for long lo longevity. There, I am excited about things like Humankind that are gonna shake up the uh, the landscape. That'll give me some more variety to play and look at. But I think I also, I also wanna step outside the 4X genre a little bit. And um, so I'll be, you know, I'm constantly thinking about how I do that. How, how do I step outside Civ content? And right now the barrier has been like time and energy and all that sort of stuff. But, I, but it's something I really seriously wanna look into. And hopefully now that I've got an editor, now that I've, I, you know, all the house renovations are almost done. We're stepping into a new office. I'm hoping that live streaming is gonna be a big way for me to explore that. And I, I may be re-examining some of my sort of impressions of things like Twitch. I, maybe I'm wrong about Twitch. Maybe it is actually a good platform for my content. And maybe it's something I should look into. Did I lose Susan to your feds? No, I still have it, okay. So there's, yeah, everything is kind of in flux right now, but the plan is, 
in the not too distant future, we'll settle back down to stability. I know things have been a bit crazy with uploads the last like year almost. Realistically, it's been like a whole year of kind of inconsistent uploads and, and, and you know, all that sort of stuff. But we are, we are coming to the tail end of those dark times. We launched another Lagrange laser station and we'll launch another one now. I'll probably start shutting up here a little bit. I kind of talked a lot uh, because we are currently traveling two light years per turn. But yeah, I'm just, I'm feeding builders into my spaceport. Every other city is just doing random stuff to keep it busy. And things are feeling good. I'm actually, I don't know. I, I, I always feel, again, I always feel a really nice sense of accomplishment when I finish a game of save. All right, there's cultural heritage, a couple extra science points. I'm going to pop those into probably uh, Geneva is fine. So we'll get that. That'll boost me from 100 and, uh, 1,100 science to 1,150 science. So that's, a, that's a nice boost of 50 science per turn here. And then we'll pick up near free future governance for another three envoys. All right, Lagrange, kaboom. That'll go next turn. Any scientist -y boys? Who's gone? Science, -y bo science boys wise. Let's have a look. Great scientists. None of the space race scientists are gone. What about the um, base race great engineers? So Robert Goddard is gone. Who are we on? Ooh, Sergei Korolov. And I'm going to get him. I'll probably spend fate to just make sure I get him and then I can finish one of these projects in a single turn for 2000 fate, which is a pretty good conversion. It allows me to convert, you know, faith and aluminum into victory progress. So I'm just kind of spamming out now, getting these last conversions. The conversion wave is essentially done here. I, I did I did what I wanted to do. I achieved what I wanted to achieve. We converted a bunch of his cities and we're future teching almost one per turn. Uh, my spies didn't even have time to really get established in Vietnam cities. Probably a mistake of mine not getting my spies fast enough. I did delay my spies a lot this game. Wait, where is all this? Where's all this culture and faith and stuff going? Does he have a grove somewhere? Hang on. Is that a ley line? Oh, I think that's a ley line. Huh. Interesting. Did you go for ley lines? Yeah, he's hermetic order. Cool. So I can see the ley line based on its yield. It's very interesting. Lagrange laser station. Perfect. A couple of spies finished their missions. Ooh, perfect. Go ahead and siphon me some funds. Not that I need them now. Probably should have been stealing more. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm researching future tech and ignoring everything else, it's because future tech, every time you finish it, uh, you get points towards a score victory and it gives you a 5% production bonus towards city projects across your entire empire, which means I am... Um, I do these things slightly faster each time. So if I do it enough times, say if I were to do it, I don't know, 10 times, it would be a 50% boost to launching Lagrange laser stations, which is what I'm doing. Speaking of Matthew Perry, Matthew Perry, Matthew Perry, Matthew Perry. He's a great admiral. Interesting. Sergei Karulov. Probably be able to buy him next turn. All right, cool. There is a great admiral. I'll send him to Mogadishu. Yeah, whatever. But Japan's annoyed that I'm recruiting great people, but like they can stay mad, kid. Getting close to completely converting this guy. I think I just put all these guys asleep now, so I don't have to worry about them. We've, we've, we've done what we needed to. We converted most of his cities. We picked up a bunch of science. We picked up a bunch of culture from it. Like our, our culture from beliefs almost doubled by converting his empire, which is fantastic, right? It's the outcome we want. Speaking of uh, science victory though, I'm at six out of 50 light years. Boom, theater square, but a Adjacency of three or higher. We got that in Dumbarton. Very nice. A little bit of extra culture. Probably irrelevant at this point in the game. But here's the thing. When you when you hit the late game, most of your decisions become irrelevant. And it's really just a f about focusing your brain power on the things that matter. So things like purchasing builders in Dumfries to feed into this spaceport. And uh, just making sure I don't miss micro my units or, or waste actions. We are slowly running out of aluminum though. Um... We're down to 48. We've used quite a bit of it. And um, we're already traveling, I believe, uh, three light years per turn. So now we're traveling four light years per turn. We're at nine out of 50. Uh, we're gonna get there very, very quick. Nifty, nifty. Let's get working on a Lagrange laser station. I'm gonna buy Sergi. I'm actually gonna do a terrestrial laser station and then use Sergi to do a Lagrange. Cause if you, if you f one turn, a terrestrial laser station it can actually um it can cause a problem where your city doesn't consider itself powered and then will uh, you'll get no progress towards your space race so you can actually lose a turn i don't know it's a weird bug that i've encountered i don't know if it's a bug or an intentional mechanic but it's something i have encountered so it's something i keep an eye out for i totally forgot that i'm at war with the kree by the way but there's the terrestrial laser station that's going to cause the city to use up a little bit more power which is fine we're going to immediately come in here and launch a Lagrange laser station. So if you look here, we're currently traveling five light years per turn. We pop in Sergi Karolalalev. Boom, Lagrange launches. And now we should be traveling six, six light years per turn. So we have another 34. So that's less than six turns. And then if I can get another terrestrial out by spamming a builder in here, um, we should be, we should be cooking with diesel. Cooking with diesel by. It's always bittersweet. So our spy leveled up by defending, I think. Um, so I'm going to give him the counter spy promotion so that he's better at defending my cities and then I'll put him back to work defending 
the um, the district. Can I? Why is right click? Why is right clicking selecting units? That is not how that's supposed to work. Again, for some reason, why can you right click to select units? I really there's like very very small little complaints about the game like that that I have that I wish were not the way things worked. Um, but I took Susan Tree of Mogadishu. Not that it really matters. They don't do a whole lot for me. They make my trader units immune to water memes. Another city state on my side. Distract the Cree. Uh, let's see. I'll vote up World Games. I'll vote up myself. I'll ban the production of coal power plants. And I'll give guitars your diplomatic victory points. Don't really care about the World Congress. I'm five turns from winning, really. If, if even. If even five turns. If I finish another one of those projects real quick. So Tamar gets trade routes. Oil power plants are banned. Batriu gets diplomatic victory points. She's actually pretty dang close, if I remember correctly. Oh, no, no, no. She's at 11 out of 20. No, I was I was miles off. She's not close at all. Never mind. Plant some woods. Feed a builder in. I need to be careful about this because if this finishes it. Okay, it didn't finish it, so that works out fine. Buy ourselves another builder. And that terrestrial laser station will launch. So there's a question you always ask yourself. We're traveling six light years per turn. We have... 28 light years to travel so actually only finishing one more of those projects will actually get me um will actually get me to the windscreen faster so it's kind of uh interesting because you, you divide the 28 by 6 right and that's um five i think and then you divide it by seven and that's also five so doing more projects really doesn't speed up my wind speed here but hey you know we'll be able to do another lagrange thingy all right terrestrial yeah, laser station like launched really... future tech finished another future tech we are we are launching these things dude right lagrange laser you counter spy on the campus Seven light years per turn with 22 to travel. Not bad. We'll get there nice and quick. I think Civ 6 has been a very successful and interesting, interesting inclusion or, or entree or entry in the Civilization franchise. Oops. Oh, no, that's fine because it's the aluminum one. Right, we finished that. Boom, we're going eight now. Terrestrial laser. And I think there's a lot of, I think that, I think this game, so we're going to win in two turns. Perfect. So we actually managed to speed it up barely. But yeah, I think... I think Civ as a game now is it's a bit like Mar it's a bit like a Marvel movie. Um so there's this huge demand for there's this huge sort of vocal demand for new and interesting games and new and interesting media in different genres like for example, you know, people want, you know, different kinds of superhero movies that subvert the genre, things like Watchmen maybe or Invincible even. I've been watching Invincible. It kind of subverts the genre, uh, the boys. But it's actually quite rare for this sort of challenging interesting new type of content to get you know to get traction um a lot of content and even those are very derivative because they're they're almost a critique or deconstruction of existing genres um but it's hard to get like new interesting intellectual properties off the ground and i think that's just mostly down to consumer habits like we all play civ because civ is the forex game um, it's the one that we're all familiar with. It's the one we all like. It's the one that everyone plays. And I think it's just, it's just the case of that thing where the popular stuff stays popular and becomes more popular. So Sid, Sid Meier actually said, um, I don't think you could make a 4X game today. Like you, you don't, you couldn't make a save game today. Um, I think Much he has a point. I think it really ago. does. You probably could make one, but it would First never be as popular as this. And I don't think an there's going to be a game that ever becomes as popular as Civ once again, as a franchise. It, things can get close for sure. I think Humankind now, is a really good example of a game that will is, is best set up to reach for that. But I think it's just one of those things where um, it's like the 15th time Batman has been remade, you know? The good stuff is good because it was good in the past and still has support. But yeah, that's uh, that's the game. We won. Uh, buildings constructed. You can see here, this is actually one of the few games where I didn't really emphasize quite as hard being top dog in the game. And Battery U actually heavily outproduced me this game um, on almost every front. Like if we look at cities settled, cities founded, Battery U completely stonked on me. I went for a slightly taller build. I didn't quite settle as many cities. I did build a lot more districts than her, which is really interesting because she built so many more buildings buildings than me but I think that's almost uh, down to a function of her building things like walls and being ahead of me and having so many more cities because again look at this de delta in cities founded okay this isn't like a small difference this is like what 11 cities that I had or, or maybe 12 cities I can't really tell yeah I think I had about 11 cities she had somewhere in the region of 20 18 18 to 20 cities so she just had way more cities to build buildings in but I do think it's really interesting the difference in the number of districts I constructed I built way more districts than her but she built way more buildings uh, if you take a look at the player science here for the vast majority of the game is there a way for me to like get rid of everyone except me and battery you because it's really just about me in vietnam in this game yeah you can see like for the vast majority of the game she was actually significantly ahead of me there were a couple of points where she had some maybe management issues and i kind of dipped down to my level but 
you know, this area here is like a massive snowball for a human player. And the thing is, I'm just slightly better than the AI at managing. So even though I'm playing behind, the trajectory of my empire curves up faster than the AI. So that's just like the big advantage you have as a player is the AI is going to be ahead of you for the majority of the game, right? And they're going to beat you in almost every metric. But the real question is, can you manipulate the game's system to even in a mostly peaceful game? I did go to war with the Khmer, which kind of helped a bit with the um, the cities captured thing. I actually captured a lot of cities this game. So maybe we were maybe we were on the same amount of cities, but she just focused more on construct. I'm, I'm really confused about this. Yeah, this is a bit weird. Because I had way more... Oh, she probably captured a bunch of cities too, actually. Yeah, she captured... Well, not quite as many. Weird. I don't know. But she she had way more culture than me this entire game. And that's just due to her unique district, giving her so much. Ah, oh, but yeah. That's uh, player's score. I love you all very much, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye!